Day 6. The break of the schedule and the giving of necklaces drew the camp together and gave us all a feeling of confidence and a penchant for adventure. One particular adventure I shall never forget. It was the mountain. Our interest and knowledge of the hill came from the ever-present loudspeaker. One evening, the normal recorded taps and Boy Scout pledge were followed by an announcement that special merit badges would be awarded to all those completing the climb to Lookout Mountain. Benny B. picked up this errant message. If the Boy Scouts can climb that mountain, can we? Dominic and I exchanged glances of doubt and surprise. Our thoughts were picked up. Spider sided with Benny. Thomas was quiet. Eric didn't think it was too neat an idea. Martin just stood there, and then, with all our attention fixed on him, he started stamping his feet in an exaggerated march step, hefting his knee high and then softly pulling his foot to the floor. Then, with his whole body in movement, he pumped his arms and in mime fashion demonstrated that he was going to climb that mountain. He was marching off to Pretoria. There was nothing to do but follow. In the morning, we made plans to find and climb Lookout Mountain. Maps in the camp office gave the trail markings and location of the mountain. It was a six-mile hike round trip. We had no idea of the terrain. For supplies, we took bags of apples, some carrots, raisins, canteens of water, and three kitchen knives. The knives were for protection. Like a military convoy, we broke it from camp at the first sight of morning. As we passed down the rows of cabins, a few sleepy campers heard our clanking progress and asked where we were going. Benny was our voice. To look out mountain. Dominic led the way, pushing Spider. Next came Benny B, wheeling himself, followed by Martin, pushing Arid. I took up the rear of the column, pushing Thomas Stewart. We looked and sounded like a wagon train. Like the pioneers before us, our faces were pushed into silence by the unknown that lay ahead. There was little talk and a strange absence of humor. A sense of fear overwhelmed any thought of adventure. Each curve in the trail presented an obstacle. Our greatest hardship was trailside bushes and branches. They slashed against the wheels and, if we were not careful, entwined themselves like tentacles around the spokes and footrests. Forging through this undergrowth reminded me of Humphrey Bogart's voyage of the African Queen. The trail kept getting narrower. It went from a walkway to a path to a skinny trail. As the trail narrowed, our effort to push the chairs increased tremendously. In methodic lunges, we crossed fields and cut into a dark wood. For the first time in my experience of pushing a wheelchair, I felt Thomas shift and lift his weight in an effort to ease the strain of movement. It was a slight adjustment, but it meant he was pulling his body as hard as I was pushing. I strained ahead to see that Arid and Spider were equally at work, lifting their weight and pushing the branches aside, using whatever energy they had to help our progress. The trail started upward. We had to turn around and pull the chairs from behind. Benny was forced to pull his wheels and then brake with each stroke. Our movement was reduced to pull, stop, pull, Stop. Pull. Perspiring and heavy for breathing, heaving for breath, I was haunted by the thought of going back. I just didn't want to turn around. It would be better to inch our way forward forever than to stop. Pull. Stop. Within this exertion, my thoughts wandered. I felt the sensation of escape, experienced in long-distance running. It's as if the mind detaches from the body. In flight, it finds refreshment and abstract wonder. I pondered the condition in which people work at intricate tasks and behavior without knowing where they are headed. Surely that is the situation I am in. Where am I going? And why am I at the base of this mountain fighting to see the top? Is it the climb that's important or the summit? Can it be both or something else? Perhaps it's how we go down from the hill that counts. Or is it in simply enduring that we find the strength and purpose we seek? Reaching exhaustion, Benny had to stop. He didn't say a word, just stop pushing. His chair slowly slid to a halt against Martin. Like a train being derailed, we twisted to a halt, chairs and bodies stacked upon each other. 
Without giving anyone the chance to think about our predicament, predicament, Spider started talking. In a shrill and quick voice, he began playing the role of Expedition Padre. Dramatically taking his canteen, he sprinkled water on the hillside and proclaimed, I hereby name this place Benny's Landing. Everyone looked up. Spider was still talking, and claimed this place and all its riches for the Acorn Society. He crossed himself and blessed the soil. Finding a willing audience, Spider continued, Mr. Thomas, I appoint you expedition recorder. Martin, you're the expeditionary leader. You counselors, you're, let's see, you're soldiers. Benny, you're our scout. The drama gave us a chance to relax and realize our accomplishment, to look around for the first time in our journey, feel the warmth of the day and the aroma of damp grass. We were in the rib of a small hill. The sun angled through the trees as if in search of someone. It splintered against the mass of rising moisture and cascaded to the ground. The air was heavy, full of light and flying things. We seemed surrounded by a soft but definable noise, a humming of insects on the move, leaves turning to the sun, seeds in flight, morning dew evaporating and billowing upward, the ground drying and pulling tight. Everyone seemed entranced by our discovery. Here we were, sitting in the middle of a forest with wheelchairs that had, until now, known only city streets and convenience ramps. Spider again broke the concentration. Well, he said, what are you waiting for, Aaron? You're the exploration cook. Break out the food. Spider was still talking as we took up the food, passed it around, and started eating. We have more places to explore than this place, you know. With this moment of rest and Spider's encouragement, our journey became enjoyable. We knew there were more places to meet, and with some patience, we would find them. And so we started off again. Benny, pleased to have a place named after him, was thrilled that each time we halted, there would be a similar honor. Sure enough, we discovered and marked our progress with Benny's Rock, Benny's Fall, Benny's Number 2, in reference to a toilet break, and Benny's Vista. By the end of the morning, we had climbed steadily into the foothills towards Lookout Mountain. Spider was talking all the way, naming birds, plants, and historic sites of interest. Thomas was keeping a mental diary, repeating points of importance to Benny and the rest of us. Aaron was directing our culinary use of supplies and dreaming up delicious ice cream sodas and banana splits. Martin seemed to spread out. He swung erratically from side to side in his effort to pull Aaron. His head moved constantly as if it were an antenna tracking some wondrous delight. Spider, family ra Spider finally ran out of things to name or count. Without hesitation, he created and performed what he called the Acorn Marching Song. If you've ever heard the slave song, Mary Mack, you will have some notion of the noise we made crossing the wilderness. After our succession of ceremonious starts and stops, we reached the final grade to the summit. We had covered over two and a half miles. The final half mile looked straight up. More forbidding than the incline, however, was the deterioration of the trail. It simply stopped. The final grade was a hillside of slate rock and loose gravel. There would be no way to pull or push the chairs up this. The wheels simply spun around for lack of traction. Spider called this place desperation, but no one laughed. Dominic suggested, how about us trying to carry everyone? Thomas nixed the idea. Not me. I'm not going any up there on someone's back. Aaron had a similar plan. I'll watch. Spider and Benny were talking wildly about a movie they saw in which climbers use ropes and things. During our deliberation, Martin had moved several feet up the hill without our noticing. He called down to us. Hey guys, it's easy. Martin was sitting down, facing downhill. By moving his legs under him in a squat position, and then pushing back, he edged up the hill in this sitting posture. He looked like he was rowing a boat, only instead of rowing across water, he was literally rowing up the hill on his bottom. Using legs and arms in an accordion fashion, he made steady progress. Benny was delighted. Martin, you're amazing, Spider added to the compliment. Make sure that man gets the mountain cross. Thomas and Aaron were still doubtful. Leaving their wheelchairs was not an easy thing to do. After a long debate and several demonstrations by Martin, we decided to make the ascent. Dominic sat against the hill, and I placed Spider in his lap. 
Using belt buckles and safety straps from the wheelchairs, I tied the two together. Dominic tried a few rows up the hill. It worked. Spider strapped to Dominic's stomach gave both of them the opportunity to look down the hill as they inched upward. It also freed Dominic's legs and arms for the hinge-like movement and balance necessary to squeeze up the hill and not slip back. Benny was next in line. He wanted to try it by himself. In a trial effort, he worked his way up the hill and right out of his pants. At his insistence, we, try, we tied a pillow from one of the chairs to his butt. He was ready. With his strength, he just might be able to drag his body the distance. Martin and Aaron were next. Martin's confidence helped Aaron. In a sitting position, Martin shaped his body and legs into a lap. I gently placed Aaron against Martin and bound them together. Thomas and I were at the end of the ladder. I sat on the ground in front of Thomas and pulled him first out of the chair and onto me. We twisted and rotated until both of us were comfortable. Then we tied ourselves together. Like a caterpillar, we edged our way up the slate. The loose rock gave and slipped into pockets that could be used as footholds. Our trail looked like a smooth slide bordered by tractor-like gouges. I thought to myself how a hiker someday would discover our tracks in the Santa Cruz Mountains would have evidence of its very own book, Bigfoot. Martin's invention was marvelous. Who would have thought of going uphill backward, sitting on our bottoms? We moved in a syncopated rhythm, first the legs pushing against the hill, followed quickly by a push with both hands. We would stop to rest and then continue. Observing the valley floor below us, we saw the tree lines slipping beneath our vision. Aware that we could now see valleys moving away from our vantage point like huge green waves. At two o'clock, according to Spider, we reached the top of Lookout Mountain. He gently gave the mountain one of his necklaces. Not the act of a conqueror, but a friend. We had done it. As with all our accomplishments, our attention shifted from the joy of lying across the peak of this mountain to another vision, the sky above us. Even Martin seemed to study the traces of clouds and the blueness of the space. It was strange. There was no jubilation. What had been the ultimate victory was now matter of fact. The sky beckoned. It gave us peace. There were seven of us lying faces up, just watching. A lonely piston engine plane droned by. I loved that distant whining sound. I don't think any of us had ever seen the sky in quite this way. The wheelchair and city life we all knew just didn't give us the chance. It was wonderful. This must be the exhilaration that drives explorers. The surprise of always finding another vista, a new thought, an unexpected strength. The comradeship of doing something together. Doing something no one else would dare. And in the end, finding something as simple and ever-present as the sky. The return trip to camp seemed half the time. We passed things we knew and places that were familiar. We knew where we were going. It was a quiet return. Our pace increased as we approached cramp, camp. Perhaps it was the idea of a waiting dinner or the chance to tell everyone about our climb. We wouldn't tell about the sky. It was our secret. We arrived late into the dining hall. In dusty halos, we tramped and rolled in. I guess all explorers expect a ticker tape parade of some kind. Surely the world knew of our exploits. But the dining room was unexplainably quiet. Thoughts tumbled into the void. Did we do something wrong? Would Mr. Bradshaw drum us out of camp? Had something happened to one of the kids? What's going on? Where's the laughter, the questioning, the noise? It's as if we had left a party of friends and returned to find another set of people engaged in a ritual we knew nothing about. We blended into the silence rather than interrupt it. Became a part of the stillness. Ate quickly without much emotion, anxious to get outside and learn what was wrong. It was like the first day of camp. I felt afraid. It didn't take long to find out what had happened. The camp director, Mr. Bradshaw, had been alarmed at the randomness of camp activities and concerned that parents visiting the camp on the following day would not find camp as it should be. To pre prepare camp for parent visit 
visitation day, he announced strict adherence to the camp schedule. We, he had finished his remarks with, we don't want to demonstrate unruly behavior at camp in front of all our parents. Now do we? We all knew what unruly behavior meant. Dominic had started teaching boys and girls the skills of cooking. He made up delicious meals. In fact, he was famous for his chopped hamburger, apple, cheese, and onion delight. It was a mixture of these ingredients rolled into a bowl and covered with aluminum foil for cooking on an open fire. It was delicious, but rather unruly, especially since most of the food was swiped from the camp kitchen. Dominic began holding a late afternoon eating club attended regularly by 40 or 50 kids. Aaron became assistant chef and apprentice. Most of these kids had never held a knife, let alone sliced a carrot. Dominic was a master at closing his eyes and trusting that determination could be any palsy or lack of sight. He was right. Dominic's success with kids prompted other forms of unruly behavior. Several women counselors had gotten interested in archery. They went to town and bought a sent out set of inexpensive bows and arrows. It wasn't the safest place to be when they held their practice, but it was a thrill to watch children struggle to use their chairs and bodies as the means to hold the bow and draw an arrow. It was pure joy to watch arrows take flight following long moments of intensive effort and patience. Another type of unruly conduct came from Lenny X. Lenny was a black African. He was mean-looking, his face scarred and twisted. You wouldn't dare meet him if it were not for his songs. Wherever he went, he would be humming or whistling. You couldn't help but join in. Pretty soon, you'd be humming the same song, catch Lenny's eye, and smile. One day, Lenny X sat down in a shady place and st just started singing. It was just after lunch when he started. He sat in that one place and sang into the late afternoon. By the time he finished, every child and counselor had learned Lenny's songs. It was such a relief from the Boy Scout anthems and bugle calls that pounced from the camp loudspeaker. Lenny taught songs that, once started, could go on forever. Evenings at camp were blessed by these sounds. One cabin would start, and others would softly join in until everyone was singing. These were the most tranquil hours I have ever experienced. Lenny considered songs a greeting. He explained to the children that in America, you greet someone with, how are you? Whereas in Europe, the greeting is, good day. And in China, it's, have you eaten? The greetings of Senegal and Gambia, Lenny explained, are like their songs. They ask, do you have peace? His songs were like this greeting. They were expressions of peace. The most unruly act of camp was perpetuated by the camp nurse, Mrs. Nelson. She was an older, matronly-looking woman who had probably served as a nurse in World War II. She always wore the same dark blue dress with matching socks rolled under at the ankles. The aging process had not been kind to Mrs. Nelson. Although she walked with a quick gait that bespoke a once spry woman, she was now quite heavy. Her face was always over-made up with bright red lipstick and swooping eyebrows. Well, it was just this sight that caught some of the girls' attention. They started asking to see how she did it. I guess this might have been the first time in a long while that anyone noticed this labor beauty. She responded by giving impromptu lessons in makeup for the girls. For most, this must have been their first taste of rouge. All of a sudden, half the girls had bright red lipstick. The next day, they smelled like a field of lilacs and all showed up wearing face cream. Of course, they thought they were beautiful. Mr. Bradshaw saw them as unruly. The prospect of ending Dominic's eating club, the straight arrow archery team, Lenny's song fest, or Mrs. Nelson's beauty salon was out of the question. The children were learning, growing, and most important of all, they were happy. I gauged my own change in these days by realizing what a benefit it would be in this Boy Scout camp. I walked around thanking stairs, bunk beds, and hills because they made us all behave a little more normally. The camp was not a place for handicapped children, and the kids knew it. Camp Wigan was a summer camp for children who could shoot arrows, cook goulash, take hikes, and sing songs. It wasn't a place for ramps, sanitized medical facilities, swimming pool rails, or activity schedules. It was a place for children and their expectations and fantasies for life.